If you don't believe that there's white privilege, please don't teach. You don't have to be a liberal to be a teacher. Welcome back to another episode of the Set at Home Mom. And the video you watched was a TikTok video that I made that made me kind of go viral. In 24 hours, I had 20,000 views and tripled the amount of followers I have and have been going up ever since. So, um, if you're not familiar with TikTok, what that was called was a stitch, which means there was a teacher that posted um, a video and that was my response to that. And I'm going to play the full video for you to get the full context of what um, the point that she was making. If you don't believe that there's white privilege, please don't teach. If you don't believe that black lives matter, please don't teach. If you don't believe in systemic racism and how it negatively impacts our students of color and don't want to help dismantle those systems, please don't teach. Most of the comments I got, you know, were kind of supportive of a lot of conservatives, but, um, yeah. Um, so let's kind of look at some of the comments here, um, that were up here. So there was this one person, and I just need to look at this so I can figure out what I'm doing. Um, but it was like, well, racism's everywhere in our society, even schools. Is it confusing that teaching kids to be anti-racist is bad? And the thing is, is like, it's all about this critical race theory ideology. And it's something that is a worldview to some people. And some people are going to have a different worldview. Um, being a Christian, I'm going to have a different worldview than someone that believes in critical race theory. Um, so this particular person, I did kind of check of her profile, and it is straight up like stereotypical progressive stuff. And she's a pre-K teacher and was talking about, you know, books to read kids about. LGBT issues and you know if she's a private school teacher and that's what that school teaches and believes in that's fine that's not the point but this other person was most likely a public school teacher and going off on these ideas um and you know it was saying things like you know I'm saying my issues Evan she was like just so to be clear teachers shouldn't teach kids to be anti-racist anti-racist so if we're not teaching them to be anti-racist we're upholding racism and it was like, well, yeah, because teachers shouldn't be indoctrinating children. I mean, what if I was um, teaching kids about my conservative beliefs, saying, you know what, da 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 da, -da. that's something that a conservative might say or something, or I say da 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 da, something a libertarian might say, and you're like, you need to keep that to yourself. Um, like, if I went around saying, like, the government is bad. <laughs> like, I mean, it just kind of wouldn't go from there. Um, but kind of what I realized was like, you know, people would be like, wait, you don't need to be a liberal to believe in white privilege. And I would ask them like, well, are you a conservative or libertarian? And they were like, no, or they didn't respond or something. Um, but it's like, you're kind of proving the whole point of what I was trying to get across. Um, you know, it's like, you know, I'm a person who believes in the fact of white privilege and white supremacy, science about it keeps things going. It's like, what I realized through engaging in a lot of these comments was that people thought that if you don't believe in white privilege or all these other things, that you somehow don't understand that racism exists or that you are not capable of teaching um, kids about racism. And... And to be honest, when you're a teacher, like, why do you need to go out of your way to teach kids things about stuff that's not even happening in your classroom? You know, I believe in those teachable moments. Did I have students um, make racist comments at some point? From what I heard, yes. It was none of those things that I could hear straight up. Now, I did hear one time um, when we were at a parent pickup, we had a parent volunteer who was Hispanic and, you know, she was just following protocol and she was just, she was an amazing parent. I really liked her. And so this guy, and yeah, he was white. He, I was close enough that I couldn't hear exactly what he said, but he was pretty frustrated that his kid was not coming out right away. And, um, I looked at her and I was like, 
what, what did he just say to you? Um, and she was like, well, he was upset that his kid wasn't coming out. And he said, well, I bet if my kid looked like, looked like you, you would have them out here right away. I mean, that was a very obviously implied low-key racist comment right there that this dude was saying. And did I have I heard students make comments or they would say, so-and-so said this about me. And I'm not saying it wasn't true or not. Um, cause you ask a kid, did you say this? And they're going to, no, I didn't say that. And you know, sometimes you don't know. And, and kids tend to repeat things that their parents hear all the time. Um, like I had a Hispanic kid that said one time I made a comment about Obama being a black guy. And I'm like, you know, his mom's white, right? And he was like, what? And I was like, uh, yeah, his mom's white and his dad's black. And the like kind of blew his mind. Um, so, you know, this one was right here. Now this one was really an interesting conversation right here. Um, you know, once again about, well, what is my provision to be doing with liberal? Like, do you, do you know anyone else besides liberals? And I, like I said, I don't think necessarily all liberals believe this. Um, and so, like he says, this sounds like a problem with you, people you're meeting, if you're blind to racial inequality. Because, I'm sorry, these comments don't show up in order on TikTok for some reason. Um, but I had originally said, well, there's not racial inequality where I taught. There was English as a second language, provided those accommodations, and I treated my kids equally, because that's true. Like, I did not treat my Hispanic kids differently than my white kids. Now, I tr treated my English language learners differently than my kids that are native English speakers in some very small areas like maybe defining a word or being like do you know what that you know do you know what that means do I need to show you a picture but because I also taught low income there was just this overall lack of a lot of um, vocabulary and things that they may not have in, been exposed to because you know kids that have parents that maybe didn't go to college or didn't read them books have less vocabulary than a kid with parents that went to college or read them a lot of books. You know, my parents never graduated college, but my goodness, did they read books and exposed us to a lot of things. Um, but we were also a middle class family. But this guy was, um, he was like, oh, I didn't realize that didn't exist. And I was like, racial inequality is not in every school district. It in not every school. Like it just, it just isn't. Um. But, you know, this was instance by making accommodations, you are addressing racial inequality. I was like, but I'm making accommodations based on language, which are legal um, requirements in the state of Texas and pro pretty much anywhere in the U.S. And it's like, no, it's because they're language learners. And it kind of got me thinking, it was like, first of all, not all English language learner learners are people of color. They can be from Asia. They can be from Europe um, and not speak the language or understand the language. You need to provide accommodations for them. And I was like, and you can have a kid that is Hispanic that doesn't even know how to speak Spanish. So you're not pro providing accommodation because he's Hispanic. Like, you know, it was like, I think it was kind of low key racist, but didn't realize that's kind of what he was doing. I said, I don't think this person was a racist. But it was kind of like, you're kind of, you kind of have a certain mindset of the way you're thinking. And because I taught it at a school with predominantly Hispanic kids and we had very few um, black kids. We had more biracial kids than black kids, actually. Um, but going on about, you know, as a white person, know exactly how a person of color feels. And if you have to sit down with them and listen to them, you might learn. The thing is, is well, which, well, which people do I choose to listen to? Because, you know... If I go watch the documentary, Uncle Tom, well, I'm going to get a totally different perspective there. Um, you know, in this comment, you know, was another one about being a liberal to know it exists. And was this one said, but if you teach children of color, the only way you can be a culture and linguistically responsive teacher is to understand your privilege. I don't need, I mean, okay, I went to college. I had grew up in a two-parent household with loving parents. I grew up middle class with just the hardworking parents. Like, I understand that I grew up and the way I was raised was differently, but I would compare that to my low-income kids because I had low-income white children that just had straight-up dysfunctional families. Dad's in jail. 
mom's high on drugs, you know, just, just whatever. Like, you know, I, I don't get me wrong. I can believe class privilege exists. Um, but it's like, I could do all those things and not believe in white privilege because if, even though I'm not a huge fan of standardized testing by any means, um, my scores kind of proved that I could accommodate my students and that they were successful. And then there was things, you know, these kind of comments about people doing your, you know, you haven't done your research. And this person's like, well, obviously you haven't read this person because it's not about being liberal. Well, the guy that wrote it was like a dang liberal. I mean, look at her username, queer little punk. Okay. Um, so that's why my response is, well, obviously you haven't read these books because I can be a little snarky in my responses sometimes. But it's if you're going to throw out the name of a book and tell someone to do their research, then it's like, well, are you doing your research too? Are you reading and listening to people that disagree with you? Because I don't think you are. You know, it's only this one thing. You know, back to this person again, um, was kind of responding, you know, kids can be thinking they want to but their color or skin affects them. And it's important to teach them how our country is built on. Um, and she kind of talked a bit a little bit about, you know, history, which I was like, I actually liked her comment because I was like, yeah, the way we teach history kind of sucks. Um, but it's like, you're still creating this victim mentality. And when I had responded at one time saying how white privilege, like when you're teaching kids the anti-racist ideology that they're inherently racist because they're white and they benefit because they're white, I'm like, you're making them feel bad. You're making them feel like crap. And, and I know this because, um... I have a friend that has been hired to do virtual learning with kids in DC and he is sitting and hearing all this critical race theory espoused to kids in the public school and he said it's in the private schools too and he says you know we both kind of agree if that's in the private schools that's that's fine um but he said you know one of his kiddos was like straight admit like it makes him feel bad because he's you know these kids are at fault for the things that their ancestors did and um you know, it's just this whole critical race theory is just one more thing I got to add to my plate of training my children to go out into the world because they're going to be around kid, adults that have been taught from this worldview and they're going to face so much more of it. And it's like, I'm hoping I've taught them the ability to think critically through these things that they can start going, well, that, that doesn't make, that doesn't make sense. You know, and, and there was even like all the comments from conservatives, even like this teacher needs to be fired and where does she work and yada, 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 and liberals are ruining school and da, 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 da. And, you know, and I, I still came to the defense of teachers because no, she shouldn't be docs. Like why are, why are conservatives jumping on this whole cancel culture thing? Like I thought we were against cancel culture, but you want to cancel people that disagree with you? Like. Let's not be hypocrites about it. Um, so in some ways I was defending the teacher and I was defending liberals like, look, hey, it's okay to believe it. They just don't need to put it in the classroom because that's unprofessional. You don't bring your politics, you don't bring your religion into the classroom. Like that's extremely unprofessional. If your students know who you voted for, that's an issue. Um, you know, I was a libertarian. My coworker was a conservative and another one of my coworkers was a liberal and on my team and you know what? we were great. A good teacher knows how to accommodate the needs of her student based on the community that she teaches in. And that can include race in some cases, you know, but if you teach in a suburban upper income district where maybe 90% of the kids are white in your school, like, you know, obviously they're going to maybe face different things because I think there can be some pressures on kids that grow up wealthy that low-income kids don't face. I don't think they're as hindering or as an extreme, but, you know, they can exist. They can exist there because people's mindset is going to be different. There might be a more push for those kids to have perfection in their academics, um, you know, a different kind of pressure. Um, but teachers do need to be aware of that kind of stuff of what their students face. And it's not necessarily going to be racism. Um, you know, when I grew up, where I grew up in Texas, like when I saw racism, it was towards Hispanic kids because we did have racism when we talked about, um, you know, civil rights, you know, Martin Luther King day and that whole week, um, we 
we talked about civil rights and stuff and what that meant back then and how racism was wrong. It was just simply like the old fashioned, old fashioned version of racism is you don't treat someone different or dislike them because of their color or their skin. But we've like taken that 10 times further and stuff. So it's like, I grew up thinking only, I only knew that racism existed against black people for the longest time because that's what I was taught. But, you know, in Texas, it was, it's totally different. I mean, I mean, that happens because there's, you know, it's, it's still Texas, we're still diverse, but there was so much more prejudice towards um, Hispanics. And I saw more prejudice towards Hispanics than, than black people by any means because in their heads, it's like, well, it's wrong to do it to black people, but we haven't really been taught, well, that's wrong to do to Hispanics as well. Um, you know, but there were definitely instances in school of like comments people would make. Um, and I definitely just, you know, it's something I heard in my community for sure. And even within my family, um, you know, I don't think it was always meant racist necessarily, but more just prejudices of, you don't understand someone's culture. And I think that's the same thing with critical race theory is you're not understanding someone else's culture, what their, what their background is. And you're just assuming something about them. You know, people will say, well, white privilege doesn't mean you don't have it hard. You just have one less disadvantaged against you. But it's like, where's the proof of that? Where is the evidence? Can you really prove in this day and age that because this person's white and this person's black, that that's the reason why, like, that that person is less disadvantaged. Like, I don't think there's enough, you know, empirical evidence that you can really prove that. I mean, I know there's a lot of good evidence, and there's definitely some major issues within the system um, that affect certain groups more than others, and I think that kind of goes back decades, and I think it also depends on where you live, but that's kind of a whole nother um, topic for discussion. So if you're looking at resources to tackle critical race theory, especially from a Christian worldview, which I'm going to suggest, go to, um, look at the Center for Biblical Unity. It is a Christian-based organization. Um, they talk about a lot, a lot of cultural issues, but they really focused a lot on the topic of critical race theory, and it's just been absolutely excellent. There's a book that has recently come out that I have not been able to get yet, but I know it talks about that on, um, on the page. Um, you can go to, you can find that channel on YouTube. You can also go to Theology Mom. Um, but yeah, you need to start, if you're not already looking into critical race theory, like you need to do so. You need to make sure you understand what it is that's going on in some public schools. Not, not where I taught, not where my husband teaches, not where my mom is at. Like, it's like, no one's talking about that. No one's talking about that stuff. So you know, I, I do think there are some schools that are, are doing a good job in, in keeping it strictly to the ap academics. Um, you know, parents want to teach that stuff at home. That's fine by me. Um, so anyway, so don't forget to like, like, subscribe, comment, and go follow me on TikTok. Like, we need to really up the homeschooling game up on there. And I wouldn't mind if some of us millennial, millennials, like, let's, let's keep taking over TikTok from these Gen Zers because, well, they're Gen Z, right? Mm -hmm.